going to present resource allocation is initialization, array I, I for Delphi. And Miguel Moreno, electronics engineer. As I said, system designer and architect, software development and systems integrator, and Embarcadero MVP for 10 years now, more than 10 years now. This is the agenda for my presentation today. I'm going to show you the history of try accept and try finally. How, where, do, where do they come from? Why we have them? Uh, comparison of those two code structures, try accept versus try finally. And then what is resource acquisition is initialization. What's that? Then introducing an explanation of the lifetime of records in Delphi. There has been some big evolution on those that you need to be aware of because thanks to that evolution applied to the compiler since 10.4, now we're in the position to compete with C++ and have some array II in Delphi with custom managed records. And I'm going to show you some examples of array II applicability by use case. And finally, some example of a real life Delphi project with array II. Finally, but not least, the questions and answers. All right, first history. Try accept and try finally together form the set of programming mechanisms and flow control structures used for exception handling. Now, many think that exception handling was introduced by C++, that's not true. Lisp, the programming language Lisp, introduced the first generic exception handling in the early 60s. Only it was a very generic, generic trapping mechanism. You could trap any kind of error, uh, store it in a, in a structure called error, and then with a function called error set, you could check. Uh, the advance here is that instead of having a program terminating and immediately going to the command line and just dumping out an error, is if you use the combination of these two keywords, you would actually able to catch the error and then you would call error set separately and then you would nicely handle it. So this was the very first time that the developers could catch an error rather than the program terminating directly to the command line. Later on, MacLisp introduced specific keywords since the designers noticed that that feature of the error and error set were being used very wisely by programmers to do real logical catching of errors to alter the process flow, then they decided that they needed to separate them. Then they dedicated the new keywords, throw catch, where you would throw an error and catch an error, but these would be logical errors, not hard errors. Then this is the first time we have these words, which actually stay nowadays in C++, but this was introduced in 1972. And then the new implementation of LISP called NIL introduced the first cleanup behavior that today we know as finally. So they didn't call it finally. They introduced this keyword called unwind protect, which do the same thing. You, if you define this code block under this keyword, you were allowed to do some cleanup code before raising the exception. So this was the very first logical implementation of a try finally, although they didn't call it try finally, they call it and we protect. In Delphi, Delphi was introduced in 1995 as an evolution of Turbo Pascal. Turbo Pascal didn't have any try finally or try except, but Delphi did. Since version one, that was one, one of the big improvements on the object Pascal language, which was um, intentionally a uh, target to be introduced once they, the evolution from the stepping up from Turbo Pascal into Delphi. So Delphi has had this concepts since the beginning of times. Now, this is a quick comparison, just a reminder of what can you achieve with these two code structures. Uh, try accept in a normal flow will come out, will come from a normal external code going to your try code block. And if there is no exception, no error happens whatsoever, then it would simply jump over the accept code the accept portion of the code and continue with your external code. That will be the normal flow when no exception happens inside your try code block. But when there is an exception, the whole idea is if that exception happens inside your try code block, the exception will be from the moment the exception is detected, can be in any point within your code block of try. 
can be at the beginning and the middle at the end doesn't matter as long as it is within your try code block if an exception is thrown or raised then the compiler will jump directly to the accept code block where you have a chance to handle the error you can either totally um, handle it completely and continue the nomas process flow or you could do some temporary handling processing and raise the error again to allow a higher level handler to handle the error. You have that option. But the point here is that the compiler is creating all these low level um, coding uh, execution so that you can have a chance to, to handle the error in case it happens. Now try finally, which is a sibling and they are like a brother and sisters in this scenario. Try finally will always execute the try portion first and then finally will be just sequentially executed right after the try block so in a normal flow finally is always executed unlike the except block in try except where except is only executed in case of an exception in a try finally the finally block is always executed why do we have it then why do we need it for well when there is an exception the difference here is that finally gets a chance to run some cleanup code now this is not handling the exception this is the difference between these two the concepts are very similar but finally is not handling the error is just doing an interim step to allow you to do some cleanup or some finalization code that needs to be done before you continue raising the error to an external handler so in this case the first part the try code block behaves exactly the same. You define your try code block where you execute your code. And in case an exception is raised, the compiler will jump immediately to finally. But now finally in this case is just allowing you that this code will always be executed. You can see here clearly that regardless there's an exception or not, finally code block is always executed. But now, why array ii well this is a concept defined by c as i was explaining in, in like the briefing before starting this presentation c notably is the only one of the top 20 most used languages today that doesn't have try finally so notably they were one of the first ones after list to introduce try catch which in delphi we call try accept so they introduced exception handlers from the very beginning. The plain vanilla C does not have exceptions handlers, doesn't have try except or try catch. C++ does. From the very beginning of the conception of C++, they introduced an exception handler. But in the decision making done with the creator, John Strostrup and his team, they decided that try finally was not a good idea. And instead, they introduced this concept called resource acquisition is initialization. So this is an idiom or code styling that is being enforced for all C++ coders and programmers since the beginning of time since C++ was introduced. So this is the way they, they say, if you wanna do something that logically looks like a try finally, use array II. That's the solution that is being promoted and enforced in C++. But you would say, what's the concept? Why they decided to do that? And how does that apply if I wanted to do that in Delphi? Does it even make sense? Well, I'm repeating here again, what you would have in a normal try finally in Delphi. On the left-hand side, you have your try code block, where if everything goes normally, you would simply step directly into the final code. But we're treating the exceptional case here. When there's an exception, the code in your try portion stops executing, but it jumps immediately to the finally code block. So then again, you have a chance to run some cleanup or finalization code in the finally code block. That's what we are used to do in Delphi. Then we just try finally when you need to um, deallocate some objects that you created on the heap or close properly a database or close a, a, a file whatever resource that you need to clean up before continuing uh, handling the exception and 
passing it over to another handler at a higher level. Now, to achieve the same logical thing in C++, this is what they tell us to do. So you create an object, which they will call the RAII object, and then the initialization code is done in the constructor of the object. And any finalization or cleanup code or the allocation, whatever, that you would normally conceptually have in a final code block, you put it in the destructor of this specially created object for this single purpose. Then you just, all of this is encapsulated in a, either on a function or in a code block. You can have an indentation to create an, an, an indented or nested code block. Why? Because that way you can see here the block in yellow represents the code block that implicitly provides the lifetime of the object that you're creating. So the idea is that you create the RAII object at the beginning of this block, either a function or a nested block. You create that object. By creating the object, the constructor will run and it will do any initialization. That's why resource acquisition is initialization. At the moment the, the object is being constructed, you acquire any resource that you need to lock in this case or acquire. Then after the object has been created in the rest of the yellow block, you have your normal code executing, your standard code. And in case an exception is raised, because in C++, when you are out of scope, the object gets destroyed automatically, then this is deterministic that if for some reason an exception is raised inside your function or inside this nested code block, the compiler will do a cleanup of the object first, the RAII object. But be, and because it's doing the cleanup of the object, it means it will call the destructor. And then implicitly when it calls the destructor, you had already put your cleanup code in the destructor of the object. So it's like an implicit or forced way to put your logic of finalization in the destructor of an object that will be uh, clean it up the moment that an exception is raised. It looks weird to explain, but actually in code, it looks very clean. But you need to understand what's happening and there's the reason I'm trying to put it here. For CSUN Delphi developers, it might look like a crazy idea. Actually, there's been a lot of discussion in many forums for standard Java developers and Delphi developers and other it's even in that net, C sharp has finally blocks. So there's a discussion in forums that the way C forces you to do a finally treatment of code is a bit crazy because they are the only ones forcing you to do this array I, I think. But nevertheless, there are some use cases that it comes handy even in, in Delphi. So let me bear with me and I'll show you some cases. So array is excellent for allocating and deallocating resources needed only within the scope of a given function or code block. Yes, this is one thing you need to keep in mind. This is perfect when you are allocating something that is the scope of where you need it is very well defined. Is used only inside a given function or is used inside a specific nested code block. It doesn't make sense if you're talking about an object that is uh, used through the whole lifetime of an application running where you have a, like a BCL application or a FireMonkey application. You're thinking of having the object created in the, in the constructor of the main program and then the allocated in. Then it doesn't make sense because the lifetime of the object is very messy to follow up. It's very messy, it doesn't really make sense. It only makes sense when you have a specific, simple to manage code of block where the lifetime of the object is deterministic. So that's why it's very specific to simple, small code blocks, namely, mostly is within a function. It's also called scope-based resource management because of this nature of what I'm explaining. It's, it's defined by the scope of the code where you are uh, introducing this object, the RAII object, then it's good for managing the resources within the scope of that code. One of these main uses is also in declaring inline variables. 
in and auto variables in C++. Because of this, it works only for resources acquired and released either directly or indirectly by stack allocated objects. Here is a catch. This static object lifetime is very well defined. The problem is that Delphi objects are always heap allocator. They are never stack allocated. Uh, just keep in mind that in Delphi, uh, normal variables, local variables in your functions or procedures, they are stack allocated. So what this phrase means is that in C++, you can have objects that behave like the local variables. They are allocated on the stack, and then the lifetime is allocated, is temporary only while the function is being executed. That's why RAII works very well in C++. But Delphi objects are not stack allocated. You need to manually create them, and they will always be in the heap. Before some of the most seasoned programmers complain out there, I made a the disclosure disclaimer at the bottom. The the good old Turbo Pascal did have stack allocated objects, but those has been deprecated, and no one at the Barcadero is recommending you to use them up because. They are legacy code is not even maintained anymore. So just to clarify, but modern Delphi objects are always heap allocated, never stack allocated. So that is the main reason why, even though Delphi is been around together with C++ and even its closest brother is Turbo C++, which now evolved into C++ Builder, even though they have, I, 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 it was never, never tried to be done in Delphi because we can't. The features of the compiler for managing objects are different. Another thing is RAII is not useful for finalization or TMA code that is not related to resource deallocation. In other words, let's say you want to run a code that does some cleanup on a database or code that does some special sending messages or whatever, that is totally not related to an allocation that you did in an inside an object. So for that, for those purposes in Delphi, just go and use try finally, the way you've done all the time. The, don't go bother with array II. But yeah, some of you will say, yes, there are some array II implementations in Delphi, but those traditionally have relied on using interfaces and reference counting. It becomes a bit messy because you need to define interfaces first, and then you need to define an object that implements that interface, and then you rely on the reference counting behavior of interfaces. It works, yes, and there's a lot of uh, frameworks out there, notably FireMonkey that uses interfaces heavily, and part of it relies on this reference counting. But I would say, if you're truly, truly need requiring interfaces as part of your design, and as a side effect, you wanna use array II, okay, fine, because you're already relying on interfaces like between code injection or dependence injection, then that's fine. But if you wanna just have a simple array II inside a simple function, the way they do it in C++, the way traditionally you would do it in Delphi is too much by doing these interfaces until now, because now let me show you what has happened with the lifetime of records in Delphi. So the first thing I need to show to you, hold on in here. I have a simple code here showing you how the standard records in Delphi behave and have behaved since the beginning of time. So I'm defining a record type here. It has three fields, a string field, an integer, and another integer. The integer call ID is one that I'm doing internally to assign a sequential ID every time a new record is assigned. So I'm just keeping some internal sequence generator, which is controlled by this global variable. Let me just compile this quickly for you here and execute it. What I'm doing in this program is defining the standard way on a header variable, header declare variable in Delphi, which is variable A, which is an instance of my record. Then once the program starts, 
I call the constructor of the record to initialize in these internal fields. So I'm assigning a name and a value. Then I will show the values. Then I'm creating another variable B, and then a variable C, and then variable D. All of these are instances of my record, but created at different points. And also I'm created another one inside a, a, a local function, a local procedure, the procedure called, called do something, then I'm creating another one. So I'm created different variables of the same my record type. Let's see what happens when we run this code. Here, here. I have added in the constructor of the record these helper functions to tell us what's going on. And I'm printing every time their their constructor of the record is called. Um, just printing out that the constructor has been called with some given parameters, and then the sequential ID of this. The sequential ID will only tell us how many times the constructor has been called for different variables. And then I have a normal method defined for the record for the record, where I'm just printing out the values. Delphi, since the beginning of time, has had smart records that allow you to add constructors, just like as if they were objects, and also allows you to add methods. Again, just like if they were objects. But the key difference is that records don't have in inheritance, so they also are not polymorphic. So all the nice things that you can do with classes, records, the only thing you can do is add methods and constructors. To make it easy and simple to manage uh, the way you create them, it would be similar to a, a class creation. But other than that, records don't have all the nitty gritty features of true inheritance and polymorphism of the Delphi classes. So that's been the very, they behave that normal records that always assign you know, on the stack. You could also dynamically create them with a new operator. So what I'm catching here is just showing you every time I call this convenience constructor when I'm assigning the internal uh, values and also calling this, dumping these values when I call show values. That's explanation what you see here. So you see that the program starts, then we have the variable A being constructed, and then I'm showing the values of that variable. And here the ID is internal sequence counter. So it was the first variable where I call the constructor, the variable A, and then the value printed. Same for, for variable B, which was created right after A. So it's the second one being created sequentially. Now we are calling the procedure do something. Inside do something, we create another variable of my record type, which is X. Then the sequential sequential id is now three so this is the third variable being constructed of my record now if you did not notice in this code i also have a nested code block this code block is a nested code block um, normally in the past this would make no difference in a delphi application nowadays it does and i will show you why but with the standard records you will not see any difference, not now. So that variable inside that code block, the nested code block, we are creating the variable C. The variable C then is being created inside the, the nested code block here. So it's the fourth my record variable being created. And then finally, after that nested block, we are creating here the variable D. So nothing special here. This is a what you would expect. This is like the norm, the way you have always seen your variables and records created in Delphi since forever. So there's no big difference here. Just bear in mind that I'm intentionally putting a header right at the beginning of the program and another one right at the end of the program. So these are our boundaries of the program, or at least the ones we are used to see all the time. But there's additional code being executed before the, this header is printed in, namely the runtime library startup and anything that the Delphi runtime code needs to do before loading your program, blah, 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 yada, yada. Same thing here. 
this is the last thing you see from your code. But after that, there's also some cleanup code done by the executable in the runtime library that are, you don't see that. But this is like a, the, the boundaries we are normally used to see. Now, I have another sample program here. Instead of standard records, now I'm defining a custom managed record, which is a big improvement in Delphi since Delphi 10.4. Custom managed records means that now, in addition to creating my convenience constructor, and also in creating a convenience method to use my records, just like as if they were classes, the problem with these two is that they were totally manual. They were optional, so not enforced by the compiler. And if they were there, you would use them on your own and at any point in time. So they were not related at all to the actual construction of the record. The record was actually being constructed the moment you are declaring it, you are declaring the variable. In other words, when I declare a variable like in this code here, that moment that variable is being created immediately because this is a global variable. So it doesn't rely on me to call unlike classes, objects, which you need to, to explicitly call the constructor so that the memory gets allocated and you, you get the pointers and the reference assigned to your variable. Objects, you need to do that before they actually exist. But a standard variable, like in this case, A, can be a global one or can be a, a, a local like this inside the, the function one. The moment they are declared inside the function or the or globally, that gets instantiated, instantiated immediately. So what happened with these two traditional constructs is that they were not linked to the, the actual lifetime of the records. What Delphi did in, in 10.4 is the custom managed records exposes these three functions which are handled specially by the compiler and the nifty thing about this is these are truly tied to the real lifetime of the record so you now you have the chance to do something when the record is originally created so the moment the compiler is creating your instance of a record you can use this function to intervene and do something customized on that record so you have a chance, the compiler allows you to do something the moment the compiler is creating your record. And by the same token, you have the chance to do something when the record is just about to be eliminated and then done some finalization. And also gives you the option to do something if you're going to copy it, copy your object, your, your record. If you're going to copy it, then it will call this function that you can redefine. So you can customize how the copy is going to be done. If you don't define any of these three functions, it will do what has been doing since forever. Just treat it as a normal record by value and then transfer everything that is inside the record as is to the other one. So that behavior is still there. But now you have the chance to alter that behavior by redefining these three functions. So I know I'm doing that right now here in this sample, in this sample customized records. So I'm defining them here, Oops, sorry, here. And then also I'm defining, uh, I'm defining some code. So in this area, you can see that In the creation where I'm leaving this as is, so the constructor is being called the same way it was in the original code with a standard record. But now I'm catching or interfering, redefining the behavior for the initialization. So namely what I'm doing here is this is called right after the compiler created the record, either globally or locally in your function, depending on where you define it. It will call this function, and then you have a chance to actually customize how the record is being initialized. Now I'm doing the same thing as with the constructor. I'm showing on the screen, hey, I'm initialized is being called, and this is the same idea that 
I've been showing before, so we can see a sequence of what's going on here. Then you get a, a, a call here. Right now, I'm all just zeroing, zeroing them out, which is similar to what the compiler would do. But here, the idea is you could have some dynamically allocated objects or some non-standard stack allocated objects that you can now do here in a record. And this is the novelty. You can create a, an object here on the heap and assign a reference here. You, do, you, you can do whatever you want because now you control what how the record is being initialized. For finalize, I'm just putting on the screen that finalize has been called. And again, with the same ID, so we can get an idea of what's going on. And then on assignment, I'm just doing the normal assignment. So I'm not introducing any fancy behavior. I'm only trapping them so you can see when they are being called by the compiler. So let's compile this thing and see what happens now. Uh, another thing is for right now to go simple, I'm commenting out all variables except A. I'm leaving just the, the variable A. You can see that variable A is a traditional one. Define it at the header, right before your main block, the, the main program call block. So I will call this header defined variable, which is a traditional way you, you've been doing it since forever, so that you can see what's the normal behavior with a header defined variables. Then we compile this code. We will go back to, oh no, sorry, I need to switch it here. All right. Compile. Okay, and then go back here. Now we'll to the second screen. CMR2. Okay, now you could see the trapping on, on these here. The big difference with the previous one is here, the first activity you could see is when the header of your main code is being written, the title of the program, the header of your main code. And the last thing you can see is exactly the last line that I'm printing out at the end of the program. Now, the difference is before the header of your program is being to print it out, you can see that here is the initialization of the variable A. Since variable A is a traditional one, it's a header variable that is being defined at the header of the program. This is the first thing that the compiler is doing, is creating your variable A. And this is happening way before your actual main code starts. That's why you would not see that before, but now you see it because I'm trapping the initialization of variable A. So variable A is being initialized here, and then the main code starts. You can see here the header of your main code. Now I'm calling my custom constructor. This screen, proves what I've been telling you that the constructor is just a needy convenience for you, but the constructor was not really tied to the moment your record is being created. So it's, the constructors for records in Delphi is just a convenience, but they are not tied to the real lifetime like they are for objects. In objects, yes, the constructors are the actual, the ones actually creating the object. They are truly tied to the lifetime of the objects. But in records, constructors are not. It's just a convenience to for you to initialize and assign the internal values. But constructors in records, traditionally in Delphi, they are not tied. But now you are, but you need to trap that new function, initialize. If you trap initialize, you are truly being called the moment the record is being created. Now you can see that this was the last line of code that we had originally in the previous one. But now this is not the last one. What you have now, instead of this one, the last line is this, when the compiler is finalizing variable A. So you can see that this is what normally happens with traditional header declare variables. Header declare variables are initialized way before your actual main code starts. And they get terminated or finalized after your main code has already ended. That's the, what you can see here, is your variable is initialized before your main code starts, and your variable is being finalized after your main code has already ended. So that's intentionally done here, so you can see what is the feature, where, what we are getting now with these new functions of finalize and initialize an assignment.
you get uh, the opportunity to be hooking up behavior when your variables, your record variables are created and when they are being terminated or destroyed. All right, let's go ahead with the version with all the other variables that you originally have, A, B, C, D, and the X inside the function. So now that you understand what I did and what kind of information you can get with these trappings that I did, let's now run this again on this one with all the variables. So you can see all the possible scenarios. All right, so this being coded now. I switch to the third screen, and now I call CMR3. So now all you see, all these initializations and finalizations for every single variable that I created in this sample program. Again, the number one being called is variable A, which is a traditional header declare variable. And as we know now, those will be initialized before your main code starts. But the other ones, I'm using the newly introduced inline variable declaration, which is also similar. I think it was 10, also 10.4 that introduced this. So inline variables now can be declared the same as C++ style or C style, which means right there at the moment you need them, you can declare them inline. Then they are created at that moment in your code. Instead of being initialized outside of your code, like the variable a is all these other ones are being initialized the moment you are declaring them so th those, this proves that these are truly inline variables case given here you can see that this variable number two is actually variable b variable b is being created here so b is an inline variable unlike a a was declared outside as a traditional header declared variable, but B is totally an inline declared variable. So as you can see, it's only at that moment when it's been declared inline that B is initialized. And then right after being initialized, immediately the constructor is being called. So here they are truly one-to-one, -one, but because of the nature of being um, declared inline. So I'm calling the constructor at the same time that I'm declaring the variable. So I'm combining the two. This declaration calls initialization, but at the same time, I'm also calling the constructor. So here, in this specific case, we can say that yes, they are linked one-to-one, -one. the initialization and the constructor is when you have inline variables declared like this, then yeah, the, the lifetime is truly linked between the constructor and the true initialization only when you have them declared as inline variables. If you're declaring them the traditional way, header declared variables, they're not. Okay, continuing with this, another thing I want to show you is then we call the do something procedure, and then the internal variable X is being initialized only until you call the procedure. Again, nothing out of this world. This is what you would expect. That was a local variable defined inside the procedure, then it will be initialized only until you call the procedure. Here, oh, sorry, here, when the variable X is being declared. And also because I'm declaring the variable in line. But if the variable was declared the traditional way as local variable here, it would behave the same because it's still a local variable and it will be only uh, initialized until you call the procedure to something. So following the sequence, you can see that after the procedure returns to the main code, then variable X, which has the ID three, is finalized because it no longer exists. Its lifetime has been terminated. Here is what you need to keep in mind. This is a perfect example of what C is telling us with the RAII objects. When you have a variable that is allocated on the stack, just like this variable x, then the lifetime is well defined, is within the scope of that function. That variable will be initialized right when the function is being called, and it will be finalized and terminated right before the function returns. So this is the scope of the lifetime of this variable. 
And when you define RAII objects in C++, this is exactly what happens. Those objects are allocated on the stack of your procedure, and then this is the lifetime you are expecting of that object. Then the whole concept of RAII is tied to the lifetime of stack allocated variables and objects. So just bear this in mind because even though we know we have this in Delphi, actually it only happens with uh, normal variables like, like uh, integers or doubles and strings and records, but not with objects. Objects in, in Delphi will always be allocated on the heat, so they don't follow this rule, normal Delphi objects. Let's go back to the code and you can see that here, I did this intentionally again to show you another case of uh, lifetime management that can is possible to do only with inline variables. If you have the nested block, this nested block, and I define variable C inside this one, then it will be created right here at this moment, but there's no difference versus B. B was created at the moment I was declaring it. The difference here is that because variable C is defined within this nested code block, then I'm delimiting the scope of the lifetime of variable C. That means that variable C exists only within this code block. So what happens is C will be initialized and used here, but as soon as we reach the end of the block, the lifetime of C will be ended. And you can see that right here. The variable C, which is the ID4, is behaving like X. Right after being used, it's being terminated. But the other variables, like variable B, variable B is still alive. You don't see any finalization of variable B because it's still valid. V is still within the whole scope. B is lives in the outer scope. B will be terminated until we reach the end of the program. But C, if I know what I'm doing, here I'm forcing C to be terminated right here. The lifetime of the variable C is only within this code block. That's what you see here. C is being terminated right here. ID4, finally. And then last but not least, we have the last variable D that is here is declared almost at the end, but still it's in the main scope of the program. So V is being created at the very end, but will we'll stay here until the end of the program. Then we have D being created is, is the last ID, initialize five. And here we're repeating the pattern that we saw in the previous program, the program number two, is first you see the end of your program, so your main code has been reached here. I'm writing the end of the program. And it's only after your code has been terminated, only after that, that the compiler will then go and terminate all the variables that were declared inside your main code block. So you see by the IDs, you can relate them. So five is the D, the last variable that we declare. Two is B that was declared um, way, way above. And one is our variable A, the one that was declared at the header level traditionally. Another thing you can see here is that they are eliminated in reverse order, in, in FIFO order. So which one, the last one that was created? D, then is the first, this is the first one to be terminated. Then what's next in order is B, then B is being terminated. And last is variable A which is the one that is been at the topmost level. So this thing that I trying to do uh, may be a bit boring, sorry about that, but you need to understand what's happening with the lifetime of these variables and records in Delphi, because normally we wouldn't care. But now because of these new methods that are available to us for custom managed records, we get a visibility on this lifetime of the records. So that's why they call it custom managed records. If you don't use these functions, then your record will behave the same as it has always done. It's the behavior of these 
initialization, finalization, and assignment is the, is decided by the compiler, and it's always treated by value, copied by value, so not changing the normal behavior. And that's what I showed to you in, in, in program number one. Here, I'm just using standard records. I'm not using any of those new features. But this is the catch now. Why would we use, once you have this understanding of the lifetime of the managed record, and that you can do something when the record is being created, and you also you can do something when the record is being destroyed, here is where the interesting thing comes for us, for the developers. This is what you would do in Delphi to implement RAII, but using custom managed records instead of interfaces. Interfaces was your only choice in the past, but now with these changes introduced to custom managed records, now you can do them much easier, much simpler, and cleaner. Now you can do simple RAII, very similar to the way you could do it in C++ in Delphi. So, what you would normally do in your try finally, now I'm using now Delphi terms instead of C++ terms. This is what you would do. You would have a custom managed record that is bound in lifetime inside a function or a nested code block. So that function or that code block dictates the lifetime of your custom managed record lifetime. And because you can manually dictate that, then you can use RAII to have the initialize uh, method of the, of the custom managed record to do something to initialize and, uh, and acquire some resources and then leverage the finalized method of your custom managed record to do the cleanup and, and finalization code. The beauty of this is this custom managed record behavior follows exactly the same way as C++. What I mean to say is the Delphi compiler will make sure that if inside your function, your code raises an exception, the compiler will make sure that this custom managed record gets finalized first. So it, it follows exactly what you would expect in C++. The destructor, in this case, the finalized method will always be called even when exceptions are raised and that's where you are leveraging. Then you can have some cleanup and finalization code inside this finalized method of your custom managed record. Um, enough of talking, I will give you some real life scenarios and examples so you can see what's happening. Where would you use it? So I'm trying to come up with very simple use cases where this would really benefit for you. Number one, the most important one, I would say, because this is also the same thing, the number one use case in C++, is working with dynamic objects. Objects that are allocated in the heap, which in the case of Delphi is all of them. You have no option. In Delphi, everything, all objects are allocated in the heap always. In C++, it's optional. You can have them on the stack, you can have them globally allocated, or you can have them in the heap. So those that are allocated in the heap, dynamically allocated, this is one of the main uses in C++, how to make sure that the object I'm creating, I'm destroying it properly. In Delphi, you would use, we're so used to use the try finally. So in an example given, you are creating a string list, then you create a string list, and then you have a finally code block to make sure that you are deallocating and freeing up the string list. So in this case, I'm showing a, a function called write text which uh, creates a file stream. A file stream is an object, it's allocated on the heap. It's allocated to internal inline variable, fs, file stream. And then I'm passing it to an array ii object that I'm calling auto free object. So I'm passing the reference to that file stream. Then I use the file stream to do some writing. I'm writing here, write text to the file stream and do some writing. But you can see I'm not calling the free method of the file stream. I don't need to because I'm leveraging the auto free object as my RAII object. I pass the reference of my file stream to the auto free object, and then I'm, I'm relying on that object to make 
free the file stream for me automatically. I don't need to worry. Why? Because I know that this file stream is only used inside the scope of this function, inside of the bright text function. Then this is the perfect case when RAII can be used. Then I have created a, a custom managed record with a specific behavior to handle my object. I call it auto free object, uh, the custom record. And you can see here, I don't need to remember to free up the object. Also, I don't need to remember to have the try finally close to free up the object. This is a perfect use case of RAII, and this is the most common use case in C++ when you are using objects allocated in the heap. So this is a perfect case where, yes, RAII comes handy. Number two case, working with mutexes and locks. So parallel programming, multi-threaded programming is very common to have semaphores or mutexes. In the case of Delphi Parallel, we call them uh, synchro objects. If you're using the standard uh, Delphi library, there are other parallel programming libraries with similar names. But the concept is the same, that a thread needs to have access to a critical part of the code, like here, we are accessing a queue. This queue is being accessed by multiple threads. Then there's a potential that they are accessing it at the same time and there's some deadlock or corruption of the queue. So you need a critical access to that one, meaning only one can be adding entries to the queue, only one thread at a time. Here in a standard Delphi code, you have some try finally code to first get the lock, get the lock on the queue, and once you get the lock, then you add the entry to the queue. And then with try finally, you remember to unlock it. If you don't unlock the, the queue, it will be in a deadlock forever. So no other uh, thread can use it anymore. Here, following RAII, I created an object called, not an object, sorry, it's a custom managed record that I'm calling auto lock. And in the initialization and finalization of these custom manage record, it will automatically, when the, when the object is, when the custom record is being destroyed at the end of this function, the destructor, the finalized method of the record will unlock this lock. So again, similar to the auto free custom record that I created in the previous example, this auto lock will make sure that it unlocks the synchro object when it reaches the end of the scope of this custom function. And it's done automatically, but it, I don't need to add try finalists, I don't need to be careful. So you may be taking a glimpse of a snapshot of why this is so popular in C++. You can see that the code looks much cleaner. At first glance, if I didn't explain all this to you, you would say, hey, this is a stupid programmer. He forgot to put try finally. Where is he releasing the lock? Or in the previous example, you would say, hey, where is he freeing up the object? What happened to these guys? Well, if you're using RAII correctly and you are a C++ guy, you will recognize this pattern, this idiom immediately. Oh, he's using RAII. And then so simple, you don't need to worry about it. And the code looks much cleaner because you don't have those extra codes just for making sure that you are releasing the resources. So this is exactly one of the key places where, again, RAII makes very good use case. But then it's, it's not everything so beautiful with RAII. That, and I'm showing you, I'm gonna show you one case of why you really didn't need it that much. Uh, sorry about that, this is in C++, but it's, the concept is the same. This is a, a function that is validating data for a record. So at the end, after the data is being validated, if everything is fine, we post the record to the data table. But here in the validation, this is a very simple example, but you get the concept. When validating, some of the data doesn't meet the constraints that I'm set in my program. My application has this constraint, uh, when I'm calling this function, one of the data fields doesn't meet the constraint that I set for it. I'm throwing, I'm, I'm raising an exception. And in C++ you call it throw, but in, in Delphi itself, you're raising an exception because the validation didn't take place. Uh, some of you might even recall that the, the 
data set objects in Delphi have a specific virtual method called validate for that uh, an event. There's an event handle for on validate that does exactly this. And the idea, the documentation prompts you to, that if for some reason the validation doesn't succeed, write an exception. The race, that exception will be caught by the dataset object and then it will release and restate, cancel. If you were editing or doing whatever, it will reset the dataset and that record gets invalidated. But here, I'm, I'm assuming that this is not a specific object. This is just genetic code. The error here is that if the data gets validated correctly, then I will reach line 15 and the data table will be posted perfectly. But if I don't, because the, er the, er the error was raised, the exception was raised here in line 12, then the data table is in an unstable state because the, the exception will be jumping out immediately out of the function. And there is no code here. There is no try finally. So here, definitely you see that there is no, the code itself is leaving the data table in an undefined state. But this data table was not acquired here. So here it would not make sense to have an array I, I object because I didn't allocate the table just locally inside this, this function. The data table is an external global object. So here the concept of allocating and deallocated for doing the cleanup would really not apply. So this is one of the use cases where array I, I is not your best solution. Here, what you need to do is Try finally, just so simple. You do the try finally. So if the exception is raised, the finally code block will be executed, the cleanup. Make sure that the data table is either canceled or posted or whatever. So, so just showing you the examples of why try finally is still the best for this, depending on the specific use case. And actually C++ guys have, have this problem when the things cannot be really tied up to the allocation of an object, they need to do all sort of tricks in order to come up with. Actually, um, in my presentation yesterday, I showed to the C++ guys how they can implement try finally code blocks in C++ for cases like this when, when you need one. And then finally, I will give you an example with these uh, real use cases of the object. So I go for my last program here. Here I'm implementing the auto free object. So you can see it's actually not an object, it's a custom managed record. So this custom managed record, I'm leveraging this, these functions that we've been talking about. I'm leveraging initialize and finalize. And also unintentionally trapping assign because the use case of this auto free object doesn't make sense with assigning. In other words, this object cannot be copied. I'm using these records to keep track of a pointer to an object that I allocated on the heap. So I don't want this to be copied. It doesn't really make sense. So I'm trapping this one so that you don't accidentally try to copy it. So that's why I need to trap all of them. These two for the actual management of the object that I'm allocated on the heap. And this one just to forbid that you do a copy with it. And this is the actual implementation. When this is the standard creation of the of the of the record, I'm passing over the reference to the object. The normal initialization by the compiler. Well, I only need to initialize that reference to nil before I assign it with a with a constructor. Then finalize. This is the key one here. When finalize get, gets called by the compiler when the of the record needs to be destroyed, then I'm simply calling the reference of the object to free itself. And that's how I'm making sure that every time this uh, custom managed record gets destroyed, if it has a good reference to an object, then it will be freed up. Now, what happens if this object reference doesn't have a true valid um, object here? Well, that's why in the constructor, I'm making sure that you truly pass a valid reference. I'm asserting that the object reference is assigned, that is not nil. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Why would you want to keep a reference to a nil object? So that is being enforced when you are constructing the object itself. All right, so here the rest is 
Similar to what I showed in the, in the presentation, this is a problem calling a file stream, and the file stream gets passed over to the auto free custom record. And then I do all my work with the file stream, and I never manually do anything with the file stream. I don't free it up, and I don't have try finally. So let's compile this code, see what happens. So here, compile. I go here, auto free object. Okay, okay. creating the file stream object, then it's brighten some data, and then the end of the program. I'm gonna type here, this is the data text, the text file that was created by this program. Um, have a version where I'm exposing intentionally what's happening by defining this, I have a defined here. So again, I'm intentionally exposing what's happening on each one of those. So you get a bit more visibility of what these um, objects are doing. It's the exact same program only with that defined enabled. I get here, I or three object two. So here you can see that when I created the file stream object and passed it over to auto free object, then I'm trapping the initialize method. I'm assigning, this one is called by the compiler first. You may recall that I'm assigning, I'm creating, making sure that when it's created, that the reference of the object is new. And then I'm calling the constructor. The constructor actually allocates and makes sure that the reference to the object is valid, that is not new. Then um, they continue to use the file stream as normal, as usual. And after that, the program gets terminated. I did nothing. But then, because the object, the array II object, uh, the custom managed record gets destroyed, then it calls the finalized internal method. And then I get the chance to get rid and free the object of the file stream. So similar to the one I showed to you at the beginning, but now with a real life usable object, the auto free object, which again, is not an object, it's a record, but we're using it like a C++ objects allocated on the stack. So this is it. This is an example of how RAII can work for you. And you can see again, once you get used to them, it does make up for cleaner code because then you don't need to show the finalization part especially when you need to just free up objects allocated on the heap and when you need to unlock mutexes. So those very specific use cases that do make sense for RAII, the code ends up being much, much cleaner because the those that are familiar with the concept and understand what's going on, they would immediately recognize, ah, this guy is using RAII. So that's why no need for any cleanup here. So thank you. This is the end of my presentation. I'm now willing to get any questions and answers from you. Okay. Um, let me just turn this off and do this. Okay, so we should be able to hear you still. Yes, oh, and we can see you even though your camera freezes. Um, yes, it freezes up. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I, a couple of people, the, the, we had some issues with um, your screen being a bit blurry in some sections. So um, people were asking if you're going to make the example projects available for download. Yeah, sure. It'll be in a repository. I'll be sending that to you. So then you can, with the final posting of the videos of the, the whole seminar, yeah, they'll, they'll be right there. Along. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll put the slides up as well. Um, that's true of all the presentations that we'll put the slides up available. Um, all the presentations, all the example code from those that have had example code in the different sessions, um, people will get told about them and we'll email you if we've emailed you already. And if not, um, check back and we'll probably put it on our blog or something like that. Um, I thought it was very interesting. It's not something I've seen before, I have to say. Um, you showed me some... Um, um, techniques that I, I'm like, oh, I never thought of that before. 
I, it's interesting the using the managed records like that is a bit of a I don't know whether it's a bit of a hack, but it's interesting because it does almost do kind of um, a bit like an interface without all the automatic reference counts in. It's very clever. So as soon as it goes out of scope, then the thing is is automatically, um, you know, uh, cleaned up. And I like that. It's actually very clever. That's why C++ guys are so used to that. But until now, in Delphi, it was clumsy. Yes, we could use interfaces, but if we do just want to do it in those very simple functions or methods, you don't go all through the burden of creating interfaces just for that. I mean, if you already have them there, okay, fine. But just for a quick ontology function, when you just want every AI, now with custom managed records, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it definitely cuts down on the extra code as well. I mean, Try finally and try accept is is all very well, but as you as you showed in your examples, it actually um, makes it a lot cleaner using the methods you've got. It takes a bit of getting used to because you know we <laughs> we've always used uh, try finally and try accept, but um, I think the idea of in some ways making it a lot safer as well because if something does go out of scope, then you know for sure it's freed up and that that that's actually very useful um, for regular records. Um, so Paul McGee said, frantically do my homework, can't wait to watch this on replay later. Paul, you're doing the homework, really? You're, you're... <laughs> I didn't think you'd still be the kind of we, we both know Paul, and uh, I'm surprised he's doing homework. <laughs> uh, I, th I think um, he's probably not a student age, but there you go, you never, never stop learning. Um, yeah, so I, I think generally uh, just a few people whinging about the uh, blurring of that. It happens. Look, you know, um, I prefer pre-recorded presentations because we can control them a little bit and uh, it streams from either my connection or from the cloud connection. I have a very, very fast internet connection. It's 2.5 gigs, so it is very fast fiber. But, um, you know, sometimes... Um, it's not so easy, and uh, it just works out that they're done live, and I, I, I get it. Some people like doing them live as well. Um, Adel said it looks like the garbage collector in Java. No Is it? way. I, I nope, don't think so. <laughs> no, Java collectors are not deterministic. RAII is very deterministic. And that's why C++ use them so heavily, because the lifetime of Java is well defined by the scope either the scope of your function or you intentionally creating those nested code blocks like the one I show. So it's super deterministic. Yeah. You know when the lifetime of the array object will end. Something that in Java you don't control at all with the Java, with the, the garbage collector. No, and in fact, that's why a lot of C++ and Delphi people don't like Java because um, there are similarities in the way that classes work and things like that. But actually, overall, Java is um, it's not uh, it's not something that most of us actually like. I think so. <laughs> we, we've all got a horror story about doing something in Java. I think um, Terry said it. I like the fact that his two presentations are related. Here is a way to implement something that C++ lacks, and here is how to do something that Delphi lacks. Something for both groups. Well done. So there you go. You have a fan. Okay. Well. Um, we're actually um, a little bit past that. Oh, and here we go. Uh, a couple of other questions. I saw the same auto-free technique in Mormot from Synops. Yes, uh, Mormot does um, some very interesting um, object handling and stuff like that, yeah. And uh, Ali says the presentation idea was uh, excellent and insightful. So you've got a few fans there, uh, Miguel. <laughs> oh, good, that I like because this is new to Delphi developers because we couldn't do it. I mean, I, I no. don't have anything against the way we create objects in Delphi. I think because as I explained, those seasoned programmers like you and me will recall Turbo Pascal did have stack allocated objects. But I think the decision to eliminate them when they jumped up to Delphi was clever. Why? because they didn't want Delphi developers go with the through nightmare that C++ developers need to do, which is remember, where did you allocate the object? In the stack, global memory, or the heap? And you need to keep track of these three separate cases individually. 
on yeah. Now, this is the power of C++, but Delphi tries to make things simpler. Then they said, just one memory model. Everything is dynamic on the heap. So that's why now everybody's used to say, I must call my constructor so it gets allocated on the heap, blah, blah, blah. And we all know this rule of thumb. There's only one rule of thumb in Delphi. But the problem is then RAII relies on stack allocated objects, which again, now we have custom managed records. I think that's what was behind Marco's team when they introduced it. They knew this would be a way to simulate a little, not fully, but a little uh, stack allocated objects in C++. Now in those Yeah, objects. yeah, because as you said, it only came in in 10.4 where this would be possible. It's one of those incidences where people say, "Well, why can't I have this in an you know an earlier version?" Well, because the capabilities to have managed records like that didn't exist. Uh, before 10.4 or right. so. Right. And uh, exactly. Patrick's impressed at, at your abuse of records <laughs> to manage classes. I, I think that's funny. Yeah, he's, oh, it's a very strange world. <laughs> but I that's what, what I had to go through the burden of, of explaining. I did spend a lot of time on explaining the lifetime because that's what's new to us Delphi developers. Again, yeah. that's like a normal life for C++ developers, but not to Delphi developers. We are not used to be so aware of the lifetime of the objects you create in memory. Because again, the normal objects will always be in the heap. But what about your variables, whether they are global or on the stack? Records behave similar as variables because they are allocated directly. They are not on the heap, they are directly. Then yeah. by doing this, you need to understand the lifetime of the actual record. So then understand why, now that they added, finalize and initialize, now you can simulate what you would do in C++ with array I, I. Yeah, and your code was good as well because it showed off so many new features like inline variables and stuff like that as well. So um, if you could have just took multi-line comments and a few other things, we would have got everything in, into one uh, demo <laughs> of many of the new features. Okay, well, it's brilliant. Um, we're coming out to uh, uh, 2.17, my time. So. Um, I think we're going to call it a day. Very popular. Um, we'll make sure that uh, Miguel's um, example code is available. And uh, I think this is your last session, isn't it? You're done now, aren't you, I think, for this uh, time round? Yes, I think that's yes. it. Yeah. Well, yep. you know, Miguel, I, I always admire what you do. You are a very smart um, developer. You You come up with some subjects that are absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, I'm pretty tired at the moment, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm like, oh, you know, it's, a, it's been a long couple of weeks, but that was a very interesting session, and, and the way you uh, explained it as well was actually very clear, because it wasn't, it's not something that's sort of faint-hearted, it's actually relatively technical, and yet you made it approachable, so well done on that, and your session yesterday was good as well, so I think you pleased C++ and Delphi people, so that that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good fit. But yeah, when I had the idea, I noticed that I actually wanted to do the C++ one of try finally, because I had a real use case in one program that I'm running for a project. Uh -huh. And as I show in the examples, there's some code that cries for try finally, but yeah. the C++ way is no, go the array I, I. But there was this code that I don't need to allocate anything. I just want some cleanup code to be run at the end every time that the, the program exits, the, the function exits. But in C++, yeah. you had no option. So that was the reason yeah. that got me to go the try finally for C++. And then I say, oh, but also Delphi guys would like to see what's here. Yeah, well, two two great sessions and, and very good. well done. All right, well, thanks a lot. I'm going to say goodbye to you, and uh, I'll see you around. We always bump into each other at various events and things like that. But thanks a lot, Miguel. Sure. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye.